Hello, kia ora team. I hope you're all doing okay. Um, I'm unfortunately unwell today. Um, I've got a bit of a sore throat, as you will probably hear throughout the course of this recording, and a bit of a stuffy nose. I'm sorry about that, particularly if it comes out uh, while I'm recording this. I've tried recording this video a couple of times. Uh, unfortunately, it keeps getting corrupted, so I'm going to try and record it as a stream. So apologies if there's any slip-ups along the way. <coughs> so uh, please bear with me while we do this. Um, what I thought I'd do, uh, our slides this week are covering orientation responses in plants and how to read and interpret actograms. Uh, so I thought I'd record this video in case it was a useful tool for you to use uh, while you were in the process of reviewing the content uh, from these slides. So I hope it's helpful. Um, uh, but if it's not, you don't need to go through it. It's okay. Um, it's just there for you. Uh, it's also there for you if you're away on the camp for this week. So what we're going to do is the first uh, lesson uh, that we're going to cover is going to be about orientation responses in plants, and there'll be a couple of things I recommend doing for mahi kainga. And then we're going to go through uh, how to read and interpret actograms, and then I'll give you your piece of mahi kainga uh, for the remainder of this week. Okay, before we get started uh, on the work for today, uh, please check this list of terms here. Uh, sorry, I'm going to sneeze in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please check this list of terms here. You might be familiar with exogenous and endogenous, but these other terms are also important as well. Um, these are terms from parts of plants. So if you don't know what these are, give it a pause, uh, take a little bit of a look at what these may be, and then uh, come back to the video. Okay. All right, let's move on to the content though, uh, for those of you who've already done this, uh, and look at what growth responses are. So growth responses come in two major groups. Our first group of growth responses is our tropisms. So hopefully you're familiar with tropisms. Uh, tropisms are directional responses. Uh, the uh, environmental stimulus is coming from a certain direction and if the uh, growth is towards that stimulus it's positive. If it's away from the stimulus we call it negative. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, there are a variety of different prefixes that you need to know. Here are some of them. Um, these will stick in front of the word tropism uh, and just describe what type of stimulus uh, is being used. So for example, if it's light that is the stimulus, the prefix we put in front of tropism is photo. So it's phototropism uh, or a phototrophic response. Uh, let's go through a couple of examples. So the first one here is a shoot. Uh, growing up towards sunlight, that would be an example of positive phototropism because it's growing towards the stimulus of light. So phototropism. Um, here we've got two examples. So we've got roots uh, growing down in the same direction as gravity. So it's positive geotropism because it's with gravity. Um, the shoots, however, are negatively geotropic. They're growing against the direction that gravity acts, so they show negative geotropism. If you wrote negative gravitropism, that would also be okay. So here we are, two different parts of the same organism uh, showing uh, different responses to the same stimuli, which is kind of important. That's kind of like uh, you want your roots to grow deep into the ground and you want your shoots to grow up nice and tall, hence why they have different responses to the same stimuli. A couple more examples here, uh, which you should be aware of. So uh, roots of, uh, sorry, yeah, here you can see uh, roots growing away from copper pipes. So copper, high levels of copper in the soil uh, might, for some organisms, be something they want to avoid. Uh, so they would have a negatively chemotrophic response because they're growing away from this chemical copper. Uh, on the other hand, you've got a positively a positive response here with thigmotropism from something like a vine, like wisteria or runner beans in this in this case. You have this positive growth uh, towards the thing that they can touch, um, and that allows the organism to be getting up and tall, nice and high, without having to spend lots of energy. Um, it can sort of piggyback on whatever other structures are present, and then uh, can expand its its leaves and uh, gain more energy. Um, out competing some of its competitors. So another thing to be looking out for when you're writing about either tropisms or nastic responses is to be thinking about how this is beneficial to the organism in question. So what adaptive advantage does this provide? In contrast, 
uh, to our directional responses of tropisms, we have non-directional responses, which we call nastic responses. Nastic responses tend to be quick, they tend to be reversible, um, and they allow plants to respond to the environment as well. Uh, one, uh, so same prefixes as before, the only one you might not have heard of is nictinasty or nictinasty, uh, which is referring to sleep movements shown by some organisms, such as our classic oxalis, um, you know, uh, doing this lovely, you know, opening up during the day and then closing down at night. A couple examples to be thinking about. So we've talked about this flower and leaf example, the photonastic response, right? Opening up during the day, maximizing sunlight, maximizing opportunities to be pollinated, and then closing uh, during the night, possibly to minimize water loss or to avoid predators or whatever it may be. Um, uh, nastic, another example would be a thigmonastic response. So if we think about Venus flytraps, for example, um, it's about the number of times a hair is touched by a fly in a certain window of time. It doesn't matter which direction the fly is coming from, it's just about the intensity of that touch, intensity of that thigmo uh, response. Uh, sorry, intensity of that thigmo stimuli, which creates the thigmonastic response. Um, so something to be thinking about uh, when you're thinking about these directional responses of tropisms is that the stimulus must also be directional. Um, so the stimulus is coming from the right, you would expect the plant to be growing towards the right if it was a positive response or away from the right if it was a negative response. Nastic responses um, are not the result of a direction of the stimulus, they're the result of the intensity of a stimulus reaching some threshold. Um, so for example, in the case of the fly, <coughs> uh, it reaches a certain threshold, and then you have that closing of the Venus flytrap. What we're going to talk about now is the mechanism that controls these nastic and trophic responses. We'll start with nastic first because they're faster, they don't involve growth. So hopefully uh, this uh, written description here reminds us of some of the things we learned in level two. So in level two we talked about uh, water potential, we talked about uh, osmotic potential, um, and we remember that plants, one of the key differences between plants and animals is that plants have large central vacuoles. Large central vacuoles that are filled with water, and when they are full, when plants are well watered, they'll be standing up nice and tall like this, nice and firm, right, turgid, because they have a high level of turgor pressure, right? Um, when you don't water a plant for a while, what does it do? It flops down, it goes all kind of sad. We call that flaccid, right? What's happening there is that water is leaving those large central vacuoles that creates less structural integrity for those cells, and as a result, the stem kind of wilts. Now, some plants can control the amount of water in their large central vacuoles by generating their own turgor pressure uh, using the release of ions particularly potassium ions. Um, so sometimes cells can do a controlled release of potassium ions, which drives water out of their large central vacuoles in certain parts of the plant, and that can result in a change in osmotic potential. Um, water moves out, and then you have this kind of movement in one position. Now that's because plants don't have muscles. They can't do this movement through those mechanisms that we use, so they use other mechanisms instead. We're gonna look at this example here uh, with Mimosa pudica, our lovely touch-me-not fern. Uh, when this fern is touched, it sort of curls up like this. It goes all kind of, you know, sad and, you know, don't, don't hurt me. Um, this is a mechanism potentially to avoid predators. And what happens here is that when a touch is sensed, this triggers the release of potassium ions on the uh, top surface of the leaf. That causes these cells, uh, the water to leave these cells as well, um, causing those cells on the inner surface to wilt. The outer surface is still nice and turgid. As a result of this difference, you have this net effect of the curling of the leaf towards that wilted side, or curling up um, around like this. So the changes in turgor pressure result in uh, these changes, these movements, or what we call a nastic response. Hopefully that is making sense. If you need to review them, that is okay. We're going to move on to trophic responses now, which are more growth responses. So just looking at this, uh, first experiments around uh, tropisms and the mechanisms that control them were carried out by Charles Darwin and some of his colleagues 
Um, they've since been uh, independently worked on by a whole bunch of other scientists. Um, and in particular, the mechanism that he tested was looking at uh, if you have a control plant with a light source over here, it'll grow, we show this phototrophic response. So he used oat coleoptils, um, but you could have used you know, mustard or any of the other ones that we've been using in class. And what he found is if you put a little cap on the tip that does not let light through, you get uh, this uh, non-phototrophic response. The plant is for some reason unable to respond to the light source. If you cover up everything except for the tip, you still get the same response that you got from your control, indicating that there is something going on with this tip. The hypothesis went that there must be some chemical produced in the tip, uh, and this chemical must travel down to the two sides and be in a higher concentration on the darker side, um, allowing that side to elongate and then to bend in the direction, allowing the shoot to grow towards the light. We now know that these chemicals uh, were in fact hormones. Just as we have hormones that help control our growth, uh, these plants have hormones as well. Um, and these hormones uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, can be effective, even in very small amounts. The class of hormones that we, we talk about are auxins. So auxins are the big name for uh, a big group of plant hormones, and they're produced primarily in the tips of shoots and stems, they're also produced in roots. Um, and there is, and they promote elongation and differentiation of cells. The big auxin you need to be aware of is indolacetic acid, or IAA. IAA is kind of the main one that you might see referred to in literature that you're reading on this, um, and IAA is produced uh, in the tips of uh, shoots and stems, and is one of the primary ones that allows this process to occur. Uh, also, auxins are produced in our roots. Uh, they are produced in a region of the root known as the meristematic region, or the apical meristem. The apical just means like very tip, um, protected by this root cap region. And then these hormones can uh, travel down to these parts and control the amount of elongation and the amount of differentiation of these different regions. You can imagine if you had more elongation on say this side here compared to this side, then you would see uh, the turning of the root uh, uh, towards whatever the stimuli was. So if there was some more water over here, you might uh, see the apical meristem sending more uh, of these auxins down this side, promoting growth towards here, or uh, whatever it may be. We'll talk about that, uh, the root example in a little bit. We're gonna refer though first to a shoot example. So here we have a light source, right? And if you can imagine, if this plant was standing like this, standing up nice and tall, <coughs> excuse me, you would have a darker side over here and a lighter side over here. More auxin is produced on the darker side, and that is then sent down that side, which then causes these cells to elongate relative to these cells on the lighter side. The net result of that is more turning from the side, so you get uh, the plant shoot, tilting towards the light. You can imagine if it overcorrected and was pointing out this side, you'd have a lighter side here and a darker side over here. So then these cells would be encouraged to promote. So it kind of self-orientates towards the light source until you have sort of an even amount of light on both sides and an even amount of auxin going down. So hopefully that makes sense and that explains the mechanisms behind phototropism. There were some further experiments done by certain researchers, uh, in particular, uh, some of the pieces of work that were done uh, looked into um, what would happen if you replaced the tip uh, of your growing uh, shoot. So these were done by Boyson and Jensen primarily, but by some other scientists as well. <coughs> and if you replace the tip, you still see the same effect as you did from the control. So uh, phototropism towards light. You also saw this effect uh, even if you had agar jelly. Um, replacing a section of uh, your uh, your shoot. Uh, you did not see it, however, with cocoa butter, which indicates that maybe cocoa butter is uh, restricting the movement of whatever your compounds are that move through and uh, promote this growth, but agar jelly does not stop this movement. The final experiment was sticking a piece of mica, um, which is kind of like, you know, it could be like a piece of cover slip, it could be a piece of plastic, something like that, um, into either the side nearest the light, in this case, or the side furthest away from the light. 
and we want to know what do you think these conclusions mean. You're welcome to pause the video and come up with a hypothesis, but I'll explain that in a second. Okay, so here's the light source. You're blocking the movement of hormones down this side, but allowing the movement down this side. Now we know auxins promote the uh, elongation and differentiation of cells uh, in the shoot. That means that the auxin can travel down this side, promote more growth relative to this side compared to that side, and then we get this net turning uh, towards the light source. However, if you block this left-hand side, you block the ability for your hormones to move down this side and promote differential growth, promoting more growth from this side than you do from this side. As a result, you have this uh, lack of movement because this side is not unable, the side that is darkest is unable to get uh, more auxin than your uh, side closest to the light. But what would happen if we replicated these experiments uh, in the dark? So we're going to have a look at a couple different experiments and see what they were f what uh, was found. The first is, what happens if you grow a normal coleopthal in the dark? You have no bending because there's no difference in light from the two sides. So you have, uh, sorry, you have an equal amount of auxin being produced on both sides, so an equal amount of elongation and therefore an equal amount of growth. What happens though if you cut the tip off and you sort of offset it? Um, well, what you see is that the side that has the tip exposed, um, you see this very lovely effect where the side uh, with the tip um, is still able to produce auxin. And so there is a little bit of auxin going down here and no auxin at all going down this side. As a result of this difference in auxin on the two sides, you have a larger amount of elongation and cell proliferation from this side compared to this side that causes a net growth in the left-hand direction, right? And if I hold up my hands in the right orientation, so you have this kind of net growth like this, right? And that's because this side here is getting less of your uh, uh, auxin, less ability to grow and proliferate, and this side here is getting um, a bunch from the tip, right? And so even though it's in complete darkness, you have this difference in auxin, and that creates this net growth in this direction, right? Um, to follow on from this, uh, here we've got a glass cover slip that has been slide, uh, slid into one side, remembering we're still in complete darkness. So you are able to produce uh, and send down auxin down this side, but none of it is making it down this side. So because we have auxin on this side and no auxin on our left-hand side, we have a net difference in the concentrations and therefore a net difference in our ability to elongate and differentiate our cells. And so our right-hand side is growing faster than our left-hand side. So we have this net movement, this net growth towards the left. Now, if those bits made like were just a little bit too quick for you, that's okay. We have some great resources on plant hormones, which I highly recommend you take a little bit of a look at. Um, so take a look at this video in particular be very helpful to you. I'll make sure uh, I try and go back and link this at the end. Okay. Um, just moving on to geotropisms now. So geotropisms, gravitropisms, are, are responses to gravity. And we're going to talk specifically about the role of auxin and the statoliths, which you hopefully had a little bit of a Google of at the start. So statoliths are these little uh, kind of starchy, heavy, uh, little sections, they're kind of organelles, and they sit within uh, cells in either the meristematic region of the root or they're in the very tip of the shoot. <coughs> Excuse me. And their uh, job is to respond to gravity, and then uh, after being responded to, after responding to gravity, this promotes high levels of auxin on the side in which they rest. So, if you imagine a root growing horizontally, uh, there is uh, more these statoliths sort of fall down to the base of these cells and as a result uh, more auxin gathers on this lower side compared to the higher side. Same happens in the shoot as well. So these auxins uh, move downwards in response to the movement of these statoliths. Now here's a key thing to know about hormones. The same hormone can have a different response in different parts of an organism. Same is true with some hormones in us, right? Um, some hormones, uh, for example, you think about adrenaline, it turns off the digestive system, it turns on the muscles, right? Auxin uh, does similar things uh, in shoots and roots. 
So uh, in the example of geotropism, right, we want uh, our roots to move down with gravity, right? So we want to have a positively geotropic response. That is what we would select for. Um, as a result, auxin, which accumulates on this lower side, inhibits growth of roots, whereas the low levels on this side allow it to continue to elongate, and that creates this net turning effect. So auxin inhibits cell elongation in roots, and that creates this net turning effect where uh, positive geotropism is observed. However, in our shoots, high levels of auxin actually turn on or increase levels of elongation and growth. That creates more growth on this lower side, encouraging uh, the development of the shoot to uh, head in the opposite direction to gravity. So a near, uh, sorry, a negatively geotropic response. Um, so hopefully that is making sense so far. Um, what I'd like you to have a little bit of a go at uh, is possibly pausing the video and taking a little bit of a look at this example of part of a question. So this example of a question asks you to discuss the advantages of thigmotropism to a climbing plant. So take a pause and give it a go. We've given you a breakdown of the kinds of things you'd want to include in your answer. So take you maybe five or 10 minutes just to kind of write something out, right? And when you get to the end of there, you can come back to the video, click play, and I'll go through the answers in a moment. Okay, just make sure when you're going through your answer, you're defining thigmotropism, explaining how that means that the that you or the plant in this example, this climbing plant, gains support from other plants, explain what the support allows the plant to do, then talk about the advantages this gives the plant, and then lastly, we want to be talking about maximizing energy and passing on its genes, right? Maximizing energy, passing on its genes. These are the two main things we're talking about. We're talking about advantages or adaptive advantages of different uh, uh, traits that a, an organism might have. So give that a go, and then when you're ready, you restart the video, okay? We're gonna move on to the next slide in three, two, one. Okay, if you look at your answer, uh, if you define thigmotropism at all, or even if you just describe that the plant's going to use another plant as support, you forgot to define thigmotropism, that's an achieved. Amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. If you explained how this would benefit organisms in general, that would get you a merit. There's a couple of examples there. The key thing that gives you E is describing this plant in question, right? And in particular, describing these links in more detail. So talking about energy and uh, allowing the uh, offspring to be produced. Um, if you found this section uh, helpful, uh, that's good. If you need to spend some more time on it, take a look at page 50 and beyond in your SciPad. Uh, that section uh, goes into a lot of detail on this and it explains it in a different way. And that might be helpful to you if you're kind of still like, oh my goodness, I'm still feeling a little bit lost. So take a little bit of a look at that uh, if this wasn't, uh, if this still hasn't sort of gotten you over the line in terms of your understanding, okay? All right, now we're going to move on to our second half of the lesson, which is on actograms. So actograms are uh, these beautiful little diagrams, but in order to understand them, we need to uh, know uh, these three terms that you can see up here. Okay, so um, take a look at phase shift, actogram, and free running period. If you know what these terms are, we can move on. If you don't, pause the video. Um, and take a moment to take a look at them on Google and then come back to us, yeah? Or DuckDuckGo, any of the, the search engine providers, bing, if you'd like to. All right, when we're ready, we'll move on. Okay, what's an actogram? Well, let's break down the word. Acto or act uh, refers to activity, right? Uh, expending of energy. And gram just means image. So it's a diagram or an image of when organisms are active and when they're inactive or at rest. Uh, normally we use these diagrams to look at circadian or daily rhythms um, to figure out whether organisms are nocturnal, diurnal, crepuscular, that sort of thing. We can also use these diagrams to look at what happens to an organism when we remove them from their normal environment and place them in constant conditions. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, what we need to know is that uh, it is these external environmental cues that allow an organism uh, to, even if it's got a bit of a ticking clock, to keep that clock set. 
right? We call this process of setting the clock entrainment or entraining the clock, right? If you remove an organism from uh, the environmental conditions that it's normally in and put it in a constant environment, what you see is the clock keeps ticking. You see this free running effect where the clock keeps ticking, but maybe it's slightly slower than 24 hours, or maybe it ticks slightly longer than every 24 hours. So over time, uh, over each day, the clock becomes more and more out of phase from the environmental cues. Um, so we talk about that as a phase shift, right? It becomes desynchronized from the normal rhythm. Um, and that tells us that there is in fact a clock tick, tick, ticking, because we can see it there, right? It tells us a little bit about the nature of that clock, right? These clocks don't normally have to be super accurate. They just have to be accurate enough to be able to be reset, right, by these external cues. Um, the other name for those external cues that set the clock is Zeitgeber, or time giver. We'll take a little bit of a look at that at a later stage. Right now, though, we're going to move on to looking at an actogram and trying to break down and understand it, okay? So here is an actogram showing the activity cycles of a cockroach. Now, don't be afraid. I'm not going to show you any images of cockroaches in this presentation. But what we need to have a little bit of a look at here uh, is trying to understand what these different parts of the diagram are. There's a lot to unpack here. So firstly, we're going to chop off half the diagram and only look at the first 10 days, right? You can see that from days 1 through 10, uh, we are obeying this bar at the top. You can ignore this one for the moment. So what we're seeing here is uh, periods of white bar and periods of dark bar. So the periods of white bar refer to uh, the lights being on, it being sunlight out. Um, you might imagine that this is a lab environment. They've got kind of a box and they kind of flick the lights on at 6 a.m. and then they keep it there for a while. And then, or maybe they, they flick the lights on at 6 a.m. Uh, they keep it there for a while. Remember the cycle's through. And then at 6 p.m. the lights go off and then all the scientists sort of, you know, leave the cameras on, or maybe one grad student's got to stay overnight and do the recording. Um, and so they stay there, it gets to midnight, gets to 6 a.m., scientist comes in and flicks the lights back on, and they keep it there. Now normally scientists will, uh, or whoever's making this, chronobiologists are the people who study uh, circadian rhythms, they like to center the period of most activity. Um, that helps, that sort of helps to make it easier to understand. So what we're looking at here, our x-axis really, hours of the day, right? Um, and our y-axis is the days. So starting at day one, we're looking at uh, when these black bars are present, that's when the organism was running around, uh, and when the black bars are not present is when the organism was inactive. We can see that the periods of activity are much greater during the darkness. What does that indicate? That indicates that the rhythm of the organism is nocturnal. It is showing a circadian rhythm, right, where it's active at one particular time each day or one chunk of time each day, and that activity period is most active during the night, so it's nocturnal. Now, after 10 days, uh, the organism was placed in constant darkness. That is what the second bar means. Instead of being uh, having the light switched on for these periods, it instead had the light switched off the whole time. <coughs> what we then see is uh, changes to the activity pattern, but you can still see there is a regular repeating pattern of when the organism is most active. What does this tell you? It tells you that it does indeed have a biological clock that keeps on ticking, right? But this ticking is slowly becoming out of phase. A few minutes, maybe 30 minutes to an hour each day, um, and after 10 days, you can see it's out by almost six hours, right? Um, so maybe this was 6 p.m. Now what this cockroach is presuming to be 6 p.m. is actually midnight, right? Which is not ideal. Um, but uh, it is telling you that uh, the organism is able to uh, freely run because it has a clock and it keeps on ticking. If only it had access to an external stimulus that it could use as a Zeitgeber, as a time giver, to tell it what time uh, it should be most active and least active, right? Now, we used to ask students to calculate uh, this free-running period, right? You can see that it's taking a little bit, so what the, the cockroach assumes is 24 hours, is actually more like 24 and a half. Um, we don't ask you to do that anymore. Um, so, who turns out biology students aren't massive fans of maths. Like, I'm a fan of maths, but 
um, it's not for everyone. So I can appreciate that. But um, yeah, so we don't ask you to do that anymore. But just so you know, you can calculate it if you wanted to. So you can see that there, that kind of tracking in this direction, that free running. Um, so a couple of terms here to know. Uh, again, same, same thing here. We've just taken out some of the detail to make it easier to see. You've got these black dots indicating when the organism was most active. You see repeating pattern of activity. So there is some sort of environmental cue triggering this, uh, the exogenous environmental cue, um, and we would call this the Zeitgeber. Uh, when you remove that, you place the organism in a constant environment, you get this free running of the clock, um, and over time this causes a phase shift where the uh, internal rhythm of the organism is out of phase with the external environment. Um, <coughs> The fact that it's got this repeating rhythm at all tells us that there must be a biological clock, which in itself is actually like, you know, it wasn't, uh, it's not a huge thing for us now because we expect there to be clocks in all the organisms of the world. But, you know, when this was first discovered, this was huge. The idea that every single organism has an internal clock keeping it to a rhythm, helping it to be adapted to its environment. Here's a question though, you've taken the organism out of its normal environment, kept it in constant conditions for a while, it's out of phase, what happens if you pop it back in phase? Uh, what happens if you pop it back into that environment? Well, what you will see is the activity patterns reset. Um, it, the organism entrains to the, uh, to the external queue, uh, to the Zeitgeber, and is able to reset its clock. And you can think about that uh, for if you were going overseas. Not that we're going to be doing that anytime soon, but if you did uh, go overseas, what you would find is that for the first couple of days, you're kind of waking up at weird times, feeling a little bit gross. But after a while, um, providing you were getting that external cue of when the sun comes up, right, and you're going to bed when it gets dark, you would be able to re-entrain your body and shift your clock back to whatever the local celestial cycle dictated. Right, so it's actually quite helpful uh, to be able to change this clock. Right, so <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so we need to be able. To do this. So uh, here's a little more of an example. Um, it's a beautiful video of squirrels um, showing their particular behaviour patterns. Um, and on this next slide, which I'm going to show you in a moment, so you're welcome to pause this and take a look at this video if you'd like to. Um, on the second uh, page, we're going to look at uh, these. Actograms of squirrels. When are squirrels most active? Let's have a look. It's when they're dark, uh, or it's when it is dark outside. What does that indicate? It indicates that the organisms are indeed nocturnal, right? You place them in constant darkness, you see this free running again. Eventually, this uh, gets out of phase with the normal cycle, right? So, just in summary, um, you have some internal and external rhythms. Um, you're welcome to take a pause and take a look at this. Just to reference uh, here, Zeitgeber, Time Giver, doesn't have to be the sun. It could be a variety of different things. For us, it's the sun. For many organisms, it's the sun. But if you're a pippy on the beach, right, maybe your external rhythm is the tides coming in or going out. Maybe it's the presence of food. Maybe it's temperature. Um, so different organisms can have different Zeitgebers, and we can investigate what those are. In fact, that is what scientists do. So just double check. Um, if you need to, pause this video, make sure that you know all of these key pieces of vocabulary, right? <coughs> and <clears throat> if you need to spend some additional time doing some research on these concepts, I highly recommend pages 35 to 37 in your SciPad. There's also this extension reading, uh, which I'd recommend as well, because one of the things that uh, we like to do uh, in biology is ask you questions relating to Aotearoa's natural wildlife. Um, so if you learn a little bit about Aotearoa's um, nocturnal organisms, you may very well see them come up. Speaking of which, what we're going to finish today with is a little NCA style question. So I'm going to break down how to answer a question or part of a question that includes actograms. And we're looking at these little cuties, the Roroa, right? Um, which is a beautiful little kiwi that lives in the, south in the South Island. So we're going to talk about them now, and that will bring us pretty much to the end of the lesson today. So, the Roro uh, lives in the South Island, they're endemic, um, uh, we observe them over 10 days and then place them in uh, constant darkness. Um, here's an actogram that they made as a result. Um, so, what can we see? Well, 
we can see that they are inactive in the middle of our normal day and they are most active at the ends of the day. What could this mean? It means they're probably nocturnal, right? We can see that for the first 10 days, they are uh, keeping this regular rhythm. As soon as we place them in constant darkness, they start to show this effect of free running, right? Now, what might this tell us? Well, before we dive into that, we can have a little bit more of a look at some of this. So we've talked about these things, right? Removal of the cue um, leads to pattern shifts, right? We know that they're nocturnal, cool beans. Let's break it down. So um, if you describe the activity pattern, in this answer, you talked how it was nocturnal, you talked about how there is a biological clock and how we can tell it, that's an achieved. Excellent. Um, if you talked about how this might help the organism in general, so it allows it to prey on uh, its prey, which come out at night, or maybe it helps it to avoid predators, which come out during the day, um, that would be perfect. But then to get that excellence, right, which is what we all should be aiming for, um, to be able to do that, you want to be talking about... Um, how the organism, uh, how these activity patterns allow the organism to survive in the ecological niche, in the particular role that they fill within uh, this uh, space. And you can see some of the detail that we want you to be thinking about here, right? So thinking about how preempting the the celestial cycle allows the organism to be better prepared than somebody who does not have that adaptation, or an organism that does not have that adaptation. Um, perhaps by triggering certain enzymes, uh, triggering certain biological processes to mean that the organism is more active and more ready to be active um, at those kinds of times of day. Uh, maybe the way that its digestive enzymes work, maybe uh, the way that it's able to predict its mating cycles, all of that kind of stuff. That's what really gets you those E marks. Now, just so you know, um, as we said before, Actigrams are not required for you to include any more uh, in terms of those calculations. We used to we used to do calculations for actigrams, but we don't do it anymore, um, which is uh, good news for a lot of students. However, as a result, uh, actigrams are now sort of included as part of a larger question in many cases. So in terms of that Kiwi question, you might have been asked more general questions about behaviors from that Kiwi, and those would have been described to you. You then would have had to identify those kind of like taxis and kinesis right, that that organism showed, and then link it to these actogram parts. So the linking bit is quite a challenge, so you need to have this prior knowledge in order to be able to link these things together. This is uh, more details on that if you want to have a little bit of a look. Uh, what we're going to finish with today, though, is another practice question. So now it's your turn. Um, and I'll just go through this question with you. You're welcome to come back to this timestamp in the video uh, if you want to pause and go through it here. I've also posted this link to our Google Classroom page. So here we have some uh, the actogram of a, of a mouse, and we want you to look at uh, exactly how this may benefit this particular organism. So I'll show you the actogram in more detail. These little notes here, LD and DD, LD means light dark, so 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. See, they just say light dark, because chronobiologists try and keep it simple, right? Um, DD just means dark all the time, so dark and then dark, right? So up until this line, the organism was kept in light, light, in, sorry, light dark conditions, where it was light and then dark, light and then dark, right? As soon as we get to this line, the organism was placed in constant darkness, and you can kind of see what happened. You see its activity pattern changing as a result. So we want you to talk about that. Um, one other thing that chronobiologists like to do is sometimes organisms' activity patterns, uh, we want to keep them kind of like easy to understand. So a, a thing that's come out of this particular discipline is it's very common to see uh, the kind of the, the whole table or the whole graph repeated right? Just one step up. So it's easy to see the patterns across multiple days. So here is day one, then that's day two. Day two is then repeated down here. So it's kind of like they've gotten this whole thing, copy pasted it over here and moved it one up. And that kind of makes it easy to see like the organism's activity as a continuous thing um, and to be able to see those kind of macroscopic patterns. So how might you answer this? Well, uh, we've put together a little bit of a description of how you could structure your answer for this. Um, so you can see here uh, some ways that you might find useful uh, to structure your answer, which I'm hoping is helpful for you. Um, 
but you don't have to stretch your answer like this. It's just helpful to have a framework to make sure you cover everything you need to cover. It's kind of sometimes uh, a bit difficult to go, oh yeah, I need to include this bit, oh yeah, I need to include that bit. So perhaps this will be a useful structure for you to include uh, when you're writing your answer to that nice question. Okay, now this pretty much brings us to the end, right? I'd like you for your mahi kainga, uh, to please uh, respond to this. So go through that mouse uh, question I had on, up on the screen before. Um, that is also on Google Classroom for us. And if you'd like to, you can send it to me via email. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pop up the, uh, the slide that has the answers to this question or what a really nice answer might look like. Um, so you're welcome to review that after you've written your answer. Um, other than that, uh, thank you very much for, for watching. Uh, I hope you're all doing okay. I'm sorry I couldn't be in for the rest of this week. But I hope you have a lovely and relaxing Easter. I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing you uh, when we get back. Uh, but I know this is a well-deserved break for all of you. So take some time to rest and relax. And I will see you all uh, in oh, after Easter, Wednesday next week. All right. Have a lovely rest of your day, team. Catch you all later. Matewa.